your Bibles to Acts 24. That's where we'll be this morning. Sorry, I'm just trying to get organized up here. Acts chapter 24. It's good to have with us this morning, Brother Ramon Briones. Did I say that right? All right. And uh, he's going to be with us throughout the day, a missionary to the Philippines. And uh, is that right? Philippines. Yes, I thought so. And uh, going to be with us throughout the day. And uh, this afternoon in our two o'clock service, we'll be watching a video from him and, and uh, hearing about his ministry that he's called to. So we're looking forward to that, Brother uh, Ramon. Do you want to introduce your wife real quick for us? <laughs> Amen. Marlene, amen. Amen. Well, we're glad that y'all are here today and uh, looking forward to hearing from you in a little while. I told him we're going to be eating and doing all this stuff. You might as well come and spend the day with us and then uh, we'll, we'll fellowship together and then we'll hear from him a little bit later on. And uh, so anyway, we're looking at Acts 24 this morning. Glad that you're here. I feel like this is a little loud. Are y'all feeling that same way? We're okay. A little bit loud. I just don't enjoy hearing myself. I'm going to move it down a little bit. All right. Um, okay, so we're looking at the conscience today. We were looking at this last, uh, last week as well. So if you have notes, that's great. If you don't have notes, I can get you some right here. So does anyone need notes from last week? I know that y'all weren't here, so yeah. yeah. It's, okay. And it's really okay if you need some. I got plenty here. Good morning. Yeah. A couple there. Good morning. Is that Terry? Yes, sir. All right. I'm going to have to see where my son is. He's usually the one I make do this. You guys okay over here? You got it? Okay. All right. You're good? Okay. All right. Sure. All right. <clears throat> what's that oh yeah gold stars for those who brought their notes today so my wife needed some though and that's concerning because she's the one that makes the, my notes so no i'm just kidding all right acts 24 we were looking at um this uh lesson five of bill below the baseline we're looking at our conscience and uh what the fact that we need to be um, building a proper conscience, a good conscience. And this is one of those things, again, as all of these things are that we're looking at, it's something that only us and the Lord really know uh, the state of. And so we said that our conscience, and I'll just, I'll catch this up because we, well, this will be kind of part two. And so um, first thing we did was we just tried to define the conscience. What is it? And, uh, and so the conscience has to do with conviction, whether or not we're hearing from the Lord. And so I compared it to a window. It's, it's like a window into our life, uh, we, we could say, is the conscience. And so if our window's clean and, and like we, you know, yesterday uh, gathered up here and all these windows were cleaned. And, and uh, so now you can see clearly out of the windows, which, you know, they weren't too bad. But I'm just saying if we, if we have a nice, clean conscience, a clean window, then, the, then we are able to hear from the Lord uh, very, very clearly. Um, there are things in our life, though, that would clutter our conscience, and, uh, and so it would, it would prevent us from hearing from God. So our conscience is, is very much how God speaks to our heart, where He applies that conviction and that leading, and, and so we, we need to strive to have a good conscience before God. So I looked at uh, 1 John 1 last week, where we talked about how that conscience, uh, well, when we get into the presence of God, um, he, if, if we're close to him, um, then, then it, it helps to cleanse and clean our conscience because of the light uh, that he is. So we looked at four different types of consciences last week. And so we, we said we all start with a good conscience. Um, this is the conscience that, is, that we're desiring for in Acts 24. If you look down to verse um, 16 was our text. It says, And herein... Um, do I exercise myself to have always a good conscience, or, or sorry, always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men? So he describes what his conscience is. Now look back at chapter 23, the verse 
that I was really thought I was reading when I was reading chapter 24. 23 verse 1, Paul says, uh, it says, And Paul earnestly beholding the council said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God unto this day. Now, he kind of defines that over in chapter 24, the verse I just read, where he says that he had no offense toward God or toward man, meaning that when his conscience is examined before God, there's no offense. When he, his conscience is examined before men, there is no offense. So this is the conscience that we should strive for. Uh, one author said there is no softer pillow than a good conscience. So when we're confessing our sins before God, when we're coming clean, we might say, before God, uh, it, it's, a, it's a really restful place to be, knowing that before God and before men, uh, we have a good conscience. And I said that there's sort of a progression that takes place as we allow sin in our life. And so the next type of conscience we see in the scriptures is the defiled conscience. The word defiled means to make dirty. So we could imagine, you know, if you're driving across the country, you got that windshield and the windshield on your way collects bugs. It collects bugs and, and it gets harder to see. And, and every now and then you got to run the wipers and, and spray some stuff on the windshield to keep it clean. And so if we're not doing that, you can understand how the further you go, the more bugs you collect. Now, I, I find this interesting here in Wyoming. I haven't found near as many bugs as where I'm from. Um, yesterday, my kids had one of those little plastic uh, things, and they're out here trying to catch bugs all day. They didn't catch one bug. And um, in, in Bastrop, they would have filled that thing up two or three times pretty easily. And so I, I, I'm assuming we'll have some bugs when it gets warmer. But right now is a blessed time to live where there are no bugs. And uh, I love that. But, but that's this idea is that all, as these bugs collect on our windshield, we're cleaning it. So to allow sin into our life is to defile the conscience. And a defiled conscience is one that is tolerating sin. So someone who is not, we, here's the facts, we all sin. We're all going to hit some bugs in our life. We're all going to have some marks upon our conscience. Here's the difference between those with a good conscience and a defiled conscience, those with the good conscience are coming to God and they're confessing their sins. They're asking him to forgive them. They're, they're pouring it out before him. He's cleaning them, just like 1 John 1, 9 tells us that he will. And so then we can go back from that defiled conscience uh, to a good conscience. The, the second evil conscience or the second bad conscience is called the evil conscience. And Hebrews tells us that there is a, a, a type of a conscience that is an evil conscience. And this is the conscience where we've allowed sin to build up in our lives, and now that sin has become a part of our lives. It's, it's a habit. And so I looked at uh, the character of Lot, who uh, Lot was a, a believer in God, but yet he allowed so much sin in his life that, um, that, that he had this evil conscience. He had an, an, a habitual allowance of it. It's like this. The more we allow, the less we hear from the Lord, the, the less we see that he is trying to get us to turn the other way. And so it's just a progression. The defiled conscience, the evil conscience, and then the Bible describes what is called the seared conscience. And the seared conscience is, is very much like uh, what, it, what it says there, is that, that our, our conscience in, in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 2 says, speaking lies in, hypocr in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. So this is where the, the conscience has no longer has any feeling. It's like, it's like sin has not just been tolerated, sin has not just been a habit, but now sin is the comfort zone of this person. Uh, they're living in sin. They're, they're, they're okay with the sin in their life. And at this point, it is very, very difficult for a person to hear from the Lord. It would just be like your windshield's completely covered. And so as you're traveling down the road, you're really in danger because you can't see where you're going. And so we want to... Um, have a good conscience, and, and a good conscience is something that Paul says here in Acts 24 is something that uh, takes some work, okay? So uh, the second bullet point today is the good conscience developed. So we're going to see how Paul describes it in Acts 24. Now remember in this chapter, and uh, last week we read all 16 verses, just for the sake of time we won't this week, um, but as Paul is being examined by these councils, right, he's being arrested for his faith. They're bringing him before governors and these governors are examining him and, and they're accusing him of all these uh, false accusations. And Paul is essentially saying, I can stand before you today 
And, and what, what, whatever you're accusing me of really doesn't matter because I can stand here before God and before men with a clean conscience. But in verse 16, he says this, I herein do exercise myself. You see that word exercise? He exercises my, himself to have always a conscience void of offense. So there's a couple of words that stand out in that verse. Number one, the, the conscience will take um, some, some exercise. It will take some work. If we're going to have a conscience that is clean before God, it will take work. It doesn't happen naturally. In fact, the progression of that um, uh, uh, defiled and evil and seared conscience, that progression tends to happen naturally because we are sinners and because we tend to get off the path. But if we want to have a good conscience, Paul says, well, it's going to take something called exercise. Now, exercise is hard if it's done correctly, isn't it? If it doesn't hurt, um, then it's probably not exercise. If it doesn't cause you to sweat or toil, then it's probably not exercise. So here is, is something we have to understand that to have that good conscience, it will take effort from us. It will, it will take some investment uh, from our lives. So there's two real points or factors that we can look at as, as it refers to exercise being needed to develop our conscience. And the first one is this, that exercise requires a goal. Someone said this, if you aim at nothing, you will what? Hit it every time, right? Everyone knows the quote. If you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. So if we don't have a, a goal in mind for our lives, well, we're going to meet that goal. We're not going to go anywhere for the Lord. Uh, listen to a couple of verses. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 25 the Bible says, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. So Paul is using uh, the analogy of sports and, and, and exercise. Like those people that are striving for the mastery, those people that are, you know, they're striving to be the best in their field, their athletic field. He said they are doing it to uh, obtain a corruptible crown. You know, if they win the, the Super Bowl, the World Series, or whatever, the Little League World Series, whatever it is, they're going to get a corruptible crown, meaning this, they're, they're going to get a trophy. They're going to get a reward uh, for their efforts. But, but they have the goal as they're practicing, they have the goal to become the best they can be so that they can get to that place where they earn that crown. Well, Paul says that's great and all, but what, what they're doing is for corruptible because all of the world's crowns will burn up. I mean, all the world's achievements and, and, and all the, you know, everywhere where someone's name is written somewhere on a plaque, those things will all go away. But we strive or, or our goals should be for this incorruptible or uncorruptible crown, meaning that the goal of the Christian life, all of our pursuits, the exercising of a good conscience, there needs to be a goal that is be better and bigger than what this world has to offer. I, the goal is very easy. It's this, that we would please the Lord. That's our goal. Um, I'm going to talk about that in the morning service. Um, that, that is why we were created, to please the Savior. Um, that is our goal. That's, that should be the point of our life and everything we do. So as we exercise to have this good conscience, we're exercising it that way so that we might please the Lord. First uh, Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1 says, Furthermore, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. So Paul is saying to this Thessalonican church, rather, that he wants you to please him. We ought to walk to please God. Uh, Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 4, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him. So our goal needs to be pleasing the Lord. You know, uh, when you got saved, it wasn't like um, the game of Monopoly where, you know, if you're lucky enough, you draw that get out of jail free card, you know, and then when someone sends you to jail, you land on that square, uh, you can just play the card and get out. Uh, a lot of people think of salvation like that. You know what? Uh, I'm, this is my card. I'm going to play to get out of hell. I'm going to escape this punishment through this salvation. Now, I'm thankful that when we are saved, the Lord does save us from hell, but he saved us to live a life that's pleasing to him. He wants not, not only our, our soul for eternity, He wants us to serve Him in this life. So we have to exercise with a goal. And here's the thing, exercise requires discipline. Now discipline, I realize in 2023, is a bad word, right? Nobody likes discipline because discipline goes against, well, what we naturally enjoy to do. 
Discipline quite literally means to go against our nature and, and put structure and boundaries in our life that, that while we could step out, we won't step out because we're going to be disciplined. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 27, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. He talks about the discipline that he is exercising in his life, and it will take discipline for us to have a clean conscience. It, it's, and, and we'll get to what it looks like in just a second. Um, in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16, Paul again tells Timothy that the Christian life is going to take discipline. He says, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. He says this, continue in them. That means, Timothy, continue in doctrine, continue in Bible study, continue in the word of God, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. So he's talking about, Timothy, the walk that you walk before God needs to be a disciplined walk. So when it's just you and God, you're disciplined. You're, you're, you're staying in the word. You're continuing in the word. And you do that so that you'll save yourself. You'll live the life God wants you to, but also you'll save others. We, we have a testimony. So um, again, personal discipline is something that's necessary in our lives. We, we need to be disciplined to abstain from sin. We need to be disciplined to uh, flee sin. We need to be disciplined to come to the Lord and confess sin when it happens. Those are disciplines that we need to have in our lives. And, and this is how we start to build and exercise to build a clean conscience. And, and personal discipline, I just want to point out, is not an act of willpower. It's not like, well, I'm just going to turn over a new leaf and I'm just going to be better and I'm going to just do a better job. And it's not a matter of willpower. I found this out. I don't have enough willpower to live the Christian life. I don't. I mean, there's just my flesh doesn't want to do what God wants me to do. It doesn't. Uh, so, so you know what it is? It's just um, it's a response to God's leading and it's an obedience. It's just saying this. Um, OK, Lord, you've spoken to my conscience. My, my flesh, my will, doesn't really want to do that, but I will do it. I will conform to what you want to have. And it's just a continual hearing from the Lord, obeying the Lord. Hearing from the Lord, obeying the Lord. It's just like when a, a mom tells their kid to eat the vegetables. No, ki no kid wants to eat the vegetables, and if it were their will, they'd just be like, no, I'll eat the macaroni and the bread and whatever else. If they don't want to eat the green beans or the broccoli or whatever, but they will eat it because mom... It's sitting right there watching them. They're going to eat it. And so again, it's just a, okay, mom, I'm going to obey. So here's what we do when God presses upon our heart. When he pricks our heart about sin, we confess those things to him. We respond in obedience. We do that over and over and over. You know what that's called? That's called discipline. It's discipline. You wake up in the morning. You know you're supposed to read your Bible. Do you feel like reading your Bible every morning? I don't. Oh, pastor, you don't feel like reading. You know what? I wake up a grouch. I mean, I wake up and I'm like, I really don't. I'm not that bad, but I do. I go straight for the coffee and I, and I, I feel like that helps somehow. And I have to wake up and then I, I have to tell myself, you know what? You're supposed to read your Bible. You need to spend time in, in his word today. And here's the thing I've, I've learned over time. I love spending time in God's word. So over time, it's much easier. You, you get disciplined. It's much easier. You get up and you're like, no, that's what I do. I, I, I don't like having that day without the Lord. So, no, I'm going to do it. But it didn't start that way. It started with a fight. The devil saying, no, you don't. You have too much to do today to spend time in his word. You, you got to get all these things done. In fact, haven't you checked Facebook yet? You know, let me just tell you this. Check the book before you check Facebook. That would help you. You know what we do as human beings right now? We wake up. And we look over at our phone first thing every morning. That's what most people do. It's, it's been researched and studied. What people do, they wake up and they look over at their phone. I've tried to make it a habit. Now, I have to slap the alarm, you know, when that happens. But I've tried to make it a habit that I, I, I click that phone off and I don't even look at it till I've spent time with the Lord. And, and why do I do that? Well, because once I look at that thing, my mind just starts going in a thousand other directions. And, and, I, and I, if I'm not careful, I won't be disciplined to get back to what I'm supposed to do. So um, really, it has to do with two components. It's dying to self, saying no to ourself, and it's saying yes to the Spirit. So um, it, we've, we've been looking at these verses in Hebrews over the last 
really since the, uh, March, uh, or really since the first part of the year, I was going to say the beginning of March, but really the first part of the year, we've been looking at Hebrews 12, 1 through 2, and, and even verse 3, that talks about that if we're going to follow and, and run the race that Christ has before us, we have to lay aside every weight. We have to put aside the sin that does so easily beset us, and, and that is just saying no to self. It's saying, no, I'll put these things aside so that I can do what God wants me to do. You know what that is? That's called discipline. It's just obeying. It's responding to God, obeying Him. And then the Scripture says, not only do we say no to ourselves, but then we are filled with the Spirit. We obey the Spirit. To be filled with the Spirit means to be controlled by the Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 says, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So he's, he's using this, this um, it's not a metaphor, it's just a comparison. He's just saying, uh, being drunk with wine, why, is, why do we not drink wine? Because it's a controlling substance. We, we put it in our body, it starts to change the way we think. So we wouldn't want to do that, so we don't drink that. And so, uh, because we wouldn't let that substance control us. He says, don't do that, but be filled with the Spirit. What he's saying is, you ought to be controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. That, that's, the, the Holy Spirit wants to come in and, and show us how to walk this Christian life, and we have to allow Him to do that. So we say no to ourselves. We say yes to the Holy Spirit. Okay, that is how we start to exercise uh, and, and build the discipline in our life to have a good conscience. And then uh, thirdly, let's see this, a good conscience displayed. A good conscience displayed. And so again, this is something that, um, you know, you can't look at me this morning and know where my conscience is at, right? You can't know by just looking at me today okay, he's got unconfessed sin in his life. Now, maybe in some worlds you can, or in some situations you can. If you're like, well, I can see the sin he's doing, and he's obviously not repenting of that. Okay, yeah, we could see that. But most of us this morning, as we look across the aisles, we're not really, we're not really let into the heart of each other. So this is a, a definitely a foundational issue in our lives, something that um, really I am the one that knows if my heart's right with God or not. But we can display a good conscience because Paul said in chapter 24, verse 16, he says he exercises himself. He's he's uh, you know what? He's built up the disciplines in his life to have a good conscience. He, he's had a, he's built up the disciplines in his life to abstain from sin, run from sin, confess sin, be right with God so that he would have a conscience. Notice what it says in verse 16, void of offense toward God and toward man. So the two points there, no surprise, a good conscience displayed toward God and toward man. This is the goal, that we are to be right in heart with God. The Bible says in Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You know, we can, we can dress up the outside all we want. I mean, we can do that, right? We can, we can polish it up. Uh, but, but God told Samuel when he was choosing a king uh, of Jesse's boys, he said, don't look on the outward appearance. He said, that's what, God, that's what men look at. They, they see the outward appearance. But the Lord looketh on what? He looketh on the heart. Okay, so it, here's the thing. We can't, I can't tell you what sin you have not confessed to God, but God knows that sin. He looks on the heart. And here's Paul, and he's saying, uh, I, I, I mean, this is an incredible testimony. He's standing before all these people, and the, the, the judges, uh, Felix is standing there, and uh, Tertullus, this guy that's this kind of a lawyer guy, he's accusing him, and, and, and they're all accusing him. And Paul's like, if you could see my heart as God sees it, you would see this, I'm clear before God. Now, that's an amazing testimony. But that's a testimony that every Christian can have. If they're living for the Lord, if they're confessing their sins often, if they're Draw, well, here's what James says, draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to you. What happens when you draw nigh to God? Well, James says this, cleanse your, your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. You know, if you're going to enter into the presence of God and you're going to be close to him, you're going to have to purify your heart. You're going to have to purify your life. You're going to cleanse your hands um, because God is not going to allow you into his presence that closely with sin. So again, our conscience should be clear toward God. You might say, well, I don't know how to do that. It's very simple. We, it's not that we live perfectly. None of us can do that. If that was the standard, then we could all go home right now. I mean, if perfection was the standard, 
And it was like, hey, to, to live a proper Christian life, you have to be perfect. Uh, let me just tell you, we should all just go home because none of us will ever do it. Uh, we're, we're looking at another week this week where we're going to live in this world. And it's just it's just going to happen that you're going to think a wrong thought. It's just going to happen that you're going to uh, maybe harbor some bitterness or you're going to deal with some anger. or You're going to have a lustful thought or maybe you're going to say something that you shouldn't say or you're going to not do something that you should do. Or whatever the case, we're looking at another week where we're going to be human beings in this world. We're not perfect. Um, so it's not, uh, okay, I'm going to be perfect. It's, I'm going to be, oh man, I, I don't have time, but I, I want to explain. I'm just going to be right with God. I'm going to be, um, I'm going to be true with God. I'm going to do, um, I'm going to, I'm going to exercise my conscience. I'm going to do all I can to avoid what God tells me to avoid. I'm going to do all I can to do what God tells me to do. But when I mess up, I'm not going to run from the Lord. I'm not going to hide it. I'm going to draw nigh to God. And uh, he'll draw nigh to you. All right, let's look then at letter B, toward men. You know, um, there's a thing that people say, and I think they say it because they, I don't know, maybe they're just sort of, boasting about how independent they are and their individuality. And, but it's a very prideful statement. They say something like this, I don't care what people think about me. You know what that, you're essentially saying? I'm right, everyone else is wrong. That's what you're essentially saying. And people would say, well, I just don't care what people think about me. L listen, you should care what people think about you. You say, well, why should you care? Because your life is a testimony to them. I mean, if I go and, and as a preacher, but then I, I leave this place and Monday, I'm living like the devil Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And people are like, well, that sorry guy, he's not anything like he preaches. And I go, well, I don't care what people think of me. How dumb is that? I'm leading people astray. I'm leading them away from God. No, we're called to have a testimony. Jesus did say, ye are the light of the world. Ye. That means that he, people are going to see you and you better care what they think. You're the light of the world. Now, I'm not saying you put on a, a fake, you know, persona to impress people. This is below the baseline stuff. This is before God first and then toward men. But he said, neither do men light a candle, put it under a bushel. Where do they put it? On a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Um, we have a testimony to uphold. That's one of the biggest ways that we'll preach to people in this world is through our testimony. Walking with the Lord faithfully. Um, again, I, I, feel like, uh, I feel like in some ways the world holds a higher standard for us than we hold for us. Did you know this? Your average lost neighbor... They know that you're not supposed to do some of the things that you're not supposed to do. Your average lost neighbor, they know you're supposed to get up on Sunday morning and go to church. They look out their window and they see you doing it. And they're like, yeah, well, they're, you know, they claim to be Christian. They ought to be going to church. The average lost neighbor, they know that you're not supposed to cuss and chew and run with the girls that do. You know, that's what people say. Um, I, I know I'm not funny, but it's early if you could humor. Okay, all right. No, your average lost neighbor knows you're not supposed to do that. Your average lost neighbor knows you're not supposed to watch pornography or, or uh, you know, watch inappropriate TV shows or listen to inappropriate. Your average lost neighbor knows that. And they're just waiting for you to do it. Why? So they can call you out and say, look at these Christians. They're no better than us. They know what you're, I mean, again, let me just say this. If the people that you deal with, that you intermingle with, the people that you work with, the people that you hang around, if they would be surprised that you're a Christian, you don't have a clean conscience before God and before me. I mean, if the people that you work with would be like, whoa, you're, you're a Christian? You go to church? You believe in the Lord? If they'd be surprised about that, we got to work on our conscience. And so again, we should care what people think. It's important that we live our lives in a way that preaches the gospel and is a witness to them because it's not just in our area of walking, but we do have a commission, a command to also do some talking. 
Um, the, Paul tells Timothy, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Did you know the gospel has been committed to our trust? That's the message that's been given to us. That's what we're supposed to be proclaiming. But if my life is not, live, if my life is not uh, matching up with the gospel that I'm preaching, no one will believe it. So again, we should care. We should never say, well, I'm just going to live how I want to live, and I don't care what anybody thinks about it. You ought to. You ought to care. Um, Paul said this, I care. We could read passage after passage after passage where he said, you know what, I could do this. I, in, in one passage, he's talking about um, offering or, or eating meat that is offered to idols. Okay, and, and here's what the Bible says about that. Meat is meat. If some person offers it to an idol, it's still just meat. That's what the Bible says. Because an idol is what? A piece of wood or a piece of brass or, or a piece of gold, whatever. So if, if, if someone says, I'm offering this ribeye steak to this staffed statue and I'm hungry, I can go eat that steak because it's just a piece of meat and they offered it to nobody. You understand? Because there's no other God but our God. That Paul, he, he develops that truth. But then he says this, but if it would make my brother to stumble. In other words, if, if someone would look at me and go, man, he's eating that meat that's been, I mean, it's been offered to that idol. If that would cause them a problem of their conscience, you know what Paul says? I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do that. Why? Because he cared what people thought of his testimony. And it wasn't a pride thing. It's like, oh, I want everyone to think I'm so good. No. You just want them to see Christ in you. You want them to see that the Lord is working on you. I'll turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter, and we'll close with this. I'm going to get out a little early. It's Friend Sunday. I'm trying to be friendly here. Okay. 1 Peter 3. No, truthfully, I want you to be able to welcome any guests that may come because you've invited them. And uh, so I, I, don't, I don't like people showing up, and then, like, we can't go talk to them in fellowship. So we're going to, I'm going to give you these verses here, and then uh, we'll, we'll close. 1 Peter 3, look at verse 15. It says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. That's what Paul did in Acts 16. He, he was able to answer, or Acts 24 rather, he was able to answer when he was questioned. He was ready to answer. Why? Well, look at the next verse in 1 Peter 3. Having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. How, how was Paul able to, to contend with false accusation in his life? Because he had a clean conscience. And he was able to give an answer to every man that asked him with meekness and fear. Why? Because his conscience was clean before God and men. They can accuse you of whatever you want, but at the end of the day, if you can go home and rest your head on a pillow and say, no, I'm right with God, and I'm right with my neighbor, listen, that's a wonderful place to be. Someone said this, if we are making a difference for Christ, people will falsely accuse us. Our best defense is to have already been building a good conscience below the baseline. So I hope you'll consider these truths about the conscience. And if, you're not, if your conscience isn't clean, you're just one prayer away. Just one repentant prayer away uh, from the Lord saying, you know, He is faithful and just to forgive us all unrighteousness, right? And cleanse, or forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That's what the Lord can do. All right, let's pray together. We'll stop there. Lord, we are thankful that uh, no matter what we are, is going on in our life, I mean, even someone who's gone all the way down to the seared conscience, Lord, you can bring back if they'll only repent. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd work on our hearts, that, you, that we would be um, sensitive to your spirit, the conviction that you bring and your leading, uh, so that, Lord, we might uh, have and be able to live, as Paul did, with a clean conscience before you and other men. Lord, help our testimonies to not be a facade that we put on the outside, but help them to be just a true reflection of what you're doing in our life. Lord, there's no sense in us hiding our faults and our sin. Uh, Lord, it, it might just 
need to be made known that no, we all we all struggle, but Lord, we we have a forgiving Savior. So Lord, help us to be what we need to be to our neighbors and those that we can be a testimony to. Father, I pray that you'd bless the day. Um, Lord, we're excited uh, to have the Briones family with us today. And we do pray for them. We pray that you'd bless the day for them and bless their travels here in the States. And then, Lord, of course, bless their ministry uh, where they're going. Uh, we are also excited about having our friend Sunday today. And, Lord, I don't know what to expect. I don't think anyone does. Um, but, Father, we just pray that uh, whoever comes through our doors, whether they're a guest or a a regular member, Lord, we, we would, we'll just praise you for what you do, and we're thankful for an opportunity to meet in your house. We pray your hand would be on the day. I ask that you would speak to our hearts. We, we know that we gather to meet with you, and so we pray that that would happen today, that you would show up in our midst, that your spirit would do a work, uh, that our hearts would be receptive to it. And so we pray for our services. We pray for our guests that may come. And uh, we just pray you'd be with us throughout the day. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you're uh, dismissed. We got about.